Hey y'all, welcome back to Biblically Blonde. In this video, we're going to talk about the Nephilim in Genesis 6. We're going to talk about what they are, what the theories are, why they happened, what God has to say about it all, and how we can apply this in our life. So if you want to kind of dig in more, understand the text of who the Nephilim were, then keep watching. Alrighty y'all, like I said in the intro, this video is about Genesis 6, 1 through 8, which is centering kind of on the Nephilim, who they were. But before we get into that, let me real quickly just tell you that my name is Lacey and I'm Biblically Blonde. Here at Biblically Blonde, we seek wholehearted living for Christian women. And a part of that is understanding the Bible and having better Bible literacy. And so that's why I do these videos. I am in the middle of a Bible guide over Genesis. And so essentially in these Bible guides, I answer what happens, why does it happen, what does it tell us about God, and how we can apply it in our daily life. So I'm going to go through that structure here when we're talking about the Nephilim. Now I do want to say, before we get anywhere, that people have very different views on the Nephilim. There are kind of three main understandings, but some people have different. If we go over this and you don't agree with the way that I view the Nephilim, that is completely fine. As long as we point towards Jesus, which no matter which view you have, it points us towards Jesus, that's okay. There are other people out there that think the Nephilim were different than what I'm going to think that they are. I'm going to tell you my point of view, why I think that, and then kind of tell you briefly what other points of view are. Now it's up to you to decide. I want you to dig into the text. I want you to read, to kind of make up for yourself what you think they actually were and what their meaning towards the whole plan from Genesis to Revelation is. And like I said, it doesn't matter which one you fall under, everything's gonna point us to the Lord. And so I don't really think it's needed to have debates, to, to get into arguments with people about disagreeing about the Nephilim. This is a small little facture of the Bible that yes, while interesting, still at the end of the day, points us towards Jesus. And that's all that matters. So let's just dig right into it. I normally typically don't read the full scripture, but I think to actually kind of get a general idea of what this is talking about, I'm going to read it and I'll put it up. So it's Genesis 6 and it's wickedness in the world. I am reading from the NIV version. It says, When human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. When the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race that I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So what is this saying? Alrighty. To understand this, we have to go back to Genesis 4 and Genesis 5. If we remember in Genesis 4, that is the story of Cain and Abel. Most people know that the first part of Genesis 4, we all can tell you the story of Cain and Abel. If you're uncertain about that, I will link it down below. I have a Bible guide just like this video over that story. But at the end of Cain and Abel, we have the story of Lamech. I also have a Bible guide on the story of Lamech. I'll link it down below once again. But at the end of Genesis 4, it tells us the story of Lamech. And Lamech is from the ancestral line of Cain. Essentially, when God sends Cain out and he goes about the rest of his life living, not following God's word and disobedience to God, God still watches over him and he is able to prosper and he has children. And from his children has children, their children have children, and so on and so forth until you come to Lamech. Lamech is the first, first polygamous man, and he has multiple wives, he's very greedy, he's very just a bad man. There's a lot that you can get dig into in Genesis 4 about the man that Lamech was. He has a little poem that he says, but essentially he was very cocky, 
pompous, not a great guy. And he is from the ancestral line of Cain. Now this is really important because then we get into Genesis 5. And Genesis 5 is the descendants from Adam to Noah, or essentially from Seth to Noah. Because if you remember right from scripture, Adam and Eve have Cain and Abel, but then they also have Seth. It's this little kind of short paragraph at the end of Genesis 4. They have Seth, their third son. And through Seth is the ancestral line to Noah, their generational line. And so we get to Noah, and we finally have the flood and so off and so forth, which is the rest of Genesis 6. And we'll get to that in later videos. But let's see here what's happening. We have the ancestral line of Cain, and then we have the ancestral line of Seth. And so we have both of these figures that are creating communities. In Genesis 4, we see that Cain's line, which brings us Lamech, is very prosperous in battle. They're very mighty. They are very strong. They're able to develop things. They're very smart. So they have you know, a society that is growing and forming. And then we look at the ancestral line of Seth and we see that they are also forming, they are also also developing. And so we really have two completely different societies forming. We have the society of God, where the Seth's line honors God, calls upon God's name. And then we have the society of Cain and his descendants who do not know the name of the Lord, who do not call to him, and in fact are very pompous and cocky and think that they are God. So we have two different lines here that all trace back to Adam and Eve, but very, very different. So then when we look at Genesis 6, and we're actually looking at the text, it says, when human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Okay. So this is where we have to kind of, this is wordplay here and it's really nerdy, but it's awesome. So we have the sons of God. I believe, and this is, like I said, there's different interpretations of this, but I kind of plug into this interpretation, that the sons of God were from Seth's generational line, and then the daughters of humans were Cain's generational line. And so, like I said, we have two different societies. One calls upon the name of God, one does not. And so that's why we get that wordplay, the sons of God. That would be Seth, because Seth's line, they are actually calling upon the name of God. They are following God and being honoring to him as best as they could. And then you have the daughters of humans. This is Cain's line. They are not calling upon the name of the Lord. They're just human beings living in sin generation after generation after generation. And so that sets it up. It's just wordplay. There's nothing complicated about it. We have two different sets of lines. So then it tells us that they are now intermarrying. And so you have Seth's line marrying into Cain's line. It tells us that the women were very beautiful from Cain's line, and so obviously the men from Seth's line took interest in them. And so you see this happening again and again and again. And these aren't small numbers of people. These are very large groups of people. I'm talking societies. I think we're thinking about it as like 10 people. I mean, this is enough people to be an entire race filling the known world at this time. So they have been prosperous to some extent, and they're marrying into each other. So then we have verse three, which is our first sign that things aren't going well here, that God does not like this. It says, then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. So this is our first sign that God's not really okay with this because God's just not gonna wipe out the entire race of people for no reason. Remember, we're always looking towards Jesus and God's plan. And to get the next step towards Jesus and the plan of resurrection and salvation is Noah, because we have to wipe out the whole world to bring about the flood and things like that. So how do we get God so angry and so disappointed and regretful in us that he does this? Well, it comes in stages. And the first stage is that he's just not happy about this. They start intermarrying, they start having children and creating a, a new generational line. And God's like, mm, I'm not very happy with this, so I'm going to limit your number. And so up until this point, people are living for hundreds and hundreds of years. Not anymore. 
their years are going to be numbered to 120, a roundabout number as such. And so that's where we get people aren't living. I mean, even up to this day, people don't live as long as they did in Bible times. And this is where we see that happening. God's putting a number on our lives because he's not happy with the generations coming from Seth marrying into Cain. So then we have the first mention of the Nephilim, and that's in verse 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were heroes of old, men of renown. Okay, so this is where it gets super kind of interesting, and this is where people have really different views because of this word Nephilim and how it's translated, how people think it's giants, how people think that these are special type humans, angels, whatever you may be. I think that's reading too much into it. What this is telling us is that this particular group of people, sons of God, marrying into daughters of humans, had children. The offspring were very renowned, were very worldly men. They were warriors. They were mighty men. This is what it's telling us here. Not that they were, you know, giants or angels or anything like that. They were just very strong. They were strong warriors. They were able to go into battle. They were mighty men and they were known for being mighty men. So they had set up a reputation. And it leads us to believe that this was some type of race that was being built off of these two ancestral lines coming together. Now we don't know everything about this because it's very limited what it's telling us here. It's just telling us a little bit. And so what we can gather is that they created a line and their offspring from this line was just very mighty. They were warrior-like and they were very accomplished. So then we get into verse 5, which tells us that the Lord saw how great and wicked the world had become. And so this leads us to believe, once again, that God is not happy. It started off with him just limiting life and saying, okay, I'm going to limit the amount that humans are going to live, to now being so regretful. It tells us that the and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on his earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So God is not happy. This tells us that by the time that we get here, which I'm assuming is many generations later, or at least many years later, a lot of offspring is what I'm saying, essentially. There's a lot of offspring that have happened by the time we get to Noah. These people do not call upon the name of God. All of Seth's generational line that know God, that call upon the name of the Lord, that's gone. They are now having idols. They are now idolizing themselves. The wickedness of Cain has completely overtaken the generational line of Seth besides Noah. Because if we get to the end here at verse 8, it said, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And so this is telling us that everyone else has turned away from God and has been so wicked that God now regrets creating them. And so the Nephilim essentially are just going to be the consequence of Seth's line marrying in to Cain's line. And because of that, we get wickedness and wickedness and more wickedness to the point where God is not happy with anyone on this earth besides Noah. So that's what happened. Let me first say here before we go into why God and how we can apply it, that there are different views on this. There is a viewpoint that the Nephilim were angels. They were fallen angels. There's also a viewpoint that the Nephilim were giants, literal giants. That's um, how you'd like to interpret it. I invite you to go and research that if you'd like. I don't fall into that category. I don't think the text is being that supernatural. I don't think the text is looking outside of that. And I think there's a lot of good arguments to argue that that's not even possible um, to re to procreate angels, that angels weren't supposed to be like that. And, I, and that's a whole separate video. And really, that's not where my focus is. The focus is always on the Lord. And I think when you get into that and trying to understand that, you're losing the focus of, of God and pointing us towards Jesus. And so, like I said, I offer to you to Google to learn more about it, but I think, 
in my heart that the text is telling us that this is about two ancestral lines, Seth and Cain, and it's really not about anything other than that. So why did this happen? Well, I've touched on this again and again. This is all about leading us towards Jesus, and the next step towards that is Noah and the flood. And so we have to get to the point where God is so mad and so upset with the human race that he is going to wipe it out. And we get that with Noah. And so God's a forgiving God. We talk again and again here on this channel about how forgiving and graceful God is. And we see that with Cain. We see that with Adam and Eve. We see that here when he first just limits the number of years that we're allowed to live as humans. I mean, God is so graceful. And so we have to get to the point where he's like, this just can't be. I have to wipe the earth of this and start fresh. And so once again, that just adds in because from Noah, we have Abraham and from Abraham, David, from David to Jesus. And so all of this, God knows is going to lead us and point us towards Jesus. And so first why to get us to Noah, the second why to get us from Noah to the Lord. So what does this tell us about God? Well, obviously it tells us that he's graceful. I touched on that. But let's look into here about kind of what does this mean about intermarriage? And we see this in Judges specifically. And it, the first mention of it is going to be here in Genesis. We have people who call upon the name of the Lord and people who don't. And God does not like when people who call upon his name intermarry with ones who do not because there are consequences to that and those consequences are not good most of the time you're not going to have someone who calls upon the name of the lord get the other person to do the same it's going to be that person losing kind of uh, little by little what they call of their religion. And so we have that happening here in Judges, and we have it happening here in Genesis. And so this tells us God's not a fan of this, that even today we need to watch who we get into relationship with. We need to watch who we are having children with. We need to watch these things. It's huge in the Bible, and it's huge in our daily life. And it's not about race or anything like that. It's about religion. Who do people call Lord? And who are you having your children with, your offspring with, your generational line? Are you having children with people who also call upon the name of the Lord and teaching your children that? Or are you letting that go and just keeping it to yourself? Because this is all about generational sin. We can track this back to Adam and their sin and then Cain's sin and now Cain's children's sin and so on and so forth. So how can we apply the story of the Nephilim to our lives? Well, I know this is really interesting because it's just a little tidbit, but we can apply it by realizing that all scripture means something. I remember when I first read this, I just kind of passed through it. I said, okay, that doesn't matter. You know, the, what does this matter towards the whole story? Well, nothing in scripture is there for no reason. Nothing. Scripture all points towards something. So when you're reading the story of Lamech in Genesis 4, you're like, okay, why does this matter? And then you get to Genesis 6, and you still have no idea why this is in here. And we wouldn't understand Genesis 6 if we did not understand the end of Genesis 4. And so the way we can apply this is remembering that all scripture has meaning and points us towards something. This is letting us understand why the flood was needed. Why did God have the flood happen? Because every single person on the earth was wicked and did not call upon the name of the Lord besides Noah and his family. And so we have to see that, yeah, maybe scripture's hard to read and maybe scripture isn't that interesting. This is not the only case where we read scripture and we have no idea what it's saying. Or maybe there's so much debate on it that we just wanna walk away and say, I only wanna focus on Jesus. And that's great, but we have to understand scripture all points to Jesus, all scripture does. And so even that little boring part or that really hard to understand part, it's really important that we dig deeper and understand why it's there because nothing's there for no reason. Alrighty, y'all, that was the Nephilim. That was Genesis 6, 1 through 8. I hope I explained it well for you. Again, if you disagree and maybe you view it a certain way, that's fine. I'm completely, uh, I understand that people don't think that that's what that is. Most people do. I think my, my viewpoint of it is the kind of the overriding popular one, I guess. I don't really like that word, but you know what I'm saying? If, if you think it's of a different 
way, that's okay. Because no matter what happens, fallen angels or giants or just the ancestral line of human beings, whatever you want to think of it, at the end of the day, it's corrupting society and then still pointing us towards the flood, which then points us towards Jesus. And so that's okay. It's okay to have different views of scripture as long as the main point at the end leads us towards Christ. Well, y'all, I will be back next time with Genesis 6. The rest of it, we'll get into Noah and the flood. If you liked this video and like to see more, please subscribe, like, comment down below. Love you so much. I'll see you next time.